I think it's not easy to introduce you in a few words. So I'll simply say that um, you're the author of a very large number of works on biblical narrative, um, probably one of the uh, best known and most recognizable biblical commentators living today. Um, and uh, you have recently released the complete version of your uh, translation of the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, uh, which I have here. I may as well show to our audience. Here are two volumes of the very nice edition, and there's a third volume as well. Um, illustrated, by the way, by uh, a wonderful Israeli art artist, uh, Mordechai Adon. Uh -huh, wonderful. Yeah, so um, this artistic aspect may actually connect to uh, the purpose of your translation in, in a way. I was actually going to begin by asking you to comment on your uh, statement in the introduction that biblical Hebrew has a distinctive music. So we already now have literature, we have music and we have art. Um, maybe you can just say a few words about how you view the Hebrew Bible and what led you to this project. Well, I kind of stumbled onto it. Uh, th that is, I began working uh, on biblical topics back in, in the late 1970s, more or less by accident, because my formal training had been in um, uh, modern literatures, modern Hebrew literature, and I'm quite fluent in, in uh, contemporary Hebrew, um, uh, French, uh, a bit of German and lots of American and English. And uh, I knew biblical Hebrew quite well. Um, uh, in my undergraduate years, I, I had taken courses at the Jewish Theological Seminary in the evening. I went to Columbia with um, H.L. Ginsburg, who was um, a, uh, a leading uh, philological scholar of the Bible of his age. So I got a, a good grasp of biblical Hebrew as distinct from later Hebrew then. And I never thought I would do anything with it. And then um, uh, back in the later 1970s, when I was writing a, a, regular, a regular article for commentary a column uh, on um, uh, Jewish life and letters, I proposed that I, I do something on the need for a literary perspective uh, on the Bible. Well, I thought that was going to be a one-off, uh, uh, and it was the top of the slippery slope. Uh, it got a lot of reaction, so I thought I'd write another article, and then uh, a third. They were not all in commentary, and uh, I ended up uh, uh, producing the um, Art of Biblical Narrative, which came out in 1981, and has been in continuous print ever since. So uh, it's sort of, I guess you would call a slow motion bestseller. Uh, it, it, uh, if you figure that it sold, sells at least 3,000 copies a year, so, so it's over 100,000 copies. Well, uh, then I went on to write a book on biblical poetry um, and uh, as a consequence of a conversation I had with uh, an editor at the New York uh, publishing house, W.W. W. Norton, I um, ended up doing, I'll, I'll skip some of the minor details, uh, a translation of Genesis. Right. I thought was going to be a, a one-time project and a kind of quixotic experiment. That is, uh, when I, I worked back in the late 70s, early 80s on my biblical narrative book, I didn't have a clue about translating the Bible. And actually the translations I did ad hoc to, to analyze were not very good. Uh, I'm afraid that they were in the thrall of uh, the Jewish Publication Society version, which I now think is wretched. Hmm. So uh, I came to the conclusion that um, uh, it was worth trying to get an English version which would convey uh, 
the stylistic finesse, the artistry, the music uh, of the Hebrew, which always spoke much so greatly to me uh, ever since I was a teenager. And um, I also thought it was not going to work because uh, as we know, the, the structure of the two languages is so radically different, modern uh, English and, and biblical Hebrew. And um, even the, the semantic range of all kinds of important terms is very different. So I figured, well, I'm going to try to do this. It's not going to work. People will hate it. I will hate it. <laughs> well, all, all translations of great works, I think, are, are no more than approximations. But it turned out that this was a better approximation than I thought I was going to do. And Genesis was well received. So I, I did the David story. Uh, and then I went on to do uh, the Torah, the five books of Moses. And I still kept saying to myself, of course, I'm not going to do the whole Bible. That's crazy. Um, but about maybe four years ago, I looked over my shoulder and I said, hey, I, I've done... Um, almost two thirds, I can really get through this. The big challenge, the, the, it was the bulk of what was left that I had not translated, was uh, Nevi'im, the, the, that is Achronim, the, the, uh, the prophets proper. And uh, that was a challenge because it, quantitatively it's very large, it's easily double the size uh, of the Torah. And um, there are uh, all kinds of problems in translating the poetry of the prophets, word play, sound play, and so forth. And then th there are enormous textual difficulties. But I got through it, and I, I was pretty happy with this, especially happy with Isaiah, I, I, I think. And uh, there it is. Bishar Tova. And... Um... Yes, that's a very interesting uh, explanation. And I wonder if there's any particular passage, short uh, selection that you might like to read us and just walk us through a few verses. And if not, I have some that I could pick uh, because I have your translation here. Well, l let me start with something very short, okay? Sure. Uh, which I have, by, I, I, I could go to the other room and get my book, but um, I have this by memory. Um, as I was making my way through the, the first chapter of Genesis, mm -hmm. I kind of had a, a little mental checklist, it wasn't written down, of the, the important features of style that, that you had to try to get in a, a, a translated version. So this would include um, the expressive use of syntax, uh, the the, um, uh, the significant use of repetition, uh, the uh, often very subtle and strategically important choice of words, um, and even sound play and puns. Uh, but there was one thing that wasn't on my checklist. Uh, and when I got to about halfway down to chapter one of Genesis, um, I got to the report of the creation of the heavenly luminaries. Um, mm -hmm. And um, uh, I translated it right off the bat this way. The great, light, the great light for dominion of day and the small light for dominion of night and the stars. Mm -hmm. Then I found myself short. I said, why dominion? Okay, the, there's one grammatical reason. That, that is, uh, the, the Hebrew doesn't say limshol. So all the translations use an infinitive to rule, to govern, and so forth. But the, the second reason, so, so uh, uh, dominion is, is um, is a noun uh, uh, as uh, memshelet is a verbal noun in the Hebrew. But then I realized that wasn't the crucial consideration. The crucial consideration 
is that, that uh, the majestic prose of the, the priestly writer in, in at the, the beginning uh, of the Torah um, has everything beautifully cadenced. And the cadences are extremely important to convey to the reader, the listener uh, in the ancient era, uh, e even subliminally, the sense of harmony, of things being completed in, in, uh, in th this architectonic way, which is rather different from the, the second version of creation. So when I had translated Dominion of day, dominion of night. I realized that I was replicating the um, the Hebrew rhythm. That is, the Hebrew sounds like this: Et Amor Hagadol LeMemshelat Hayom, Viet Amor Hakaton LeMemshelat Halayla, Viet Hakochavim. Then to repeat my translation: The great light for dominion of day, and the small light for dominion of night and the stars. So that's pretty close to, to the way the rhythm of the Hebrew sounds. So this alerted me to a, a very important aspect of biblical prose. It's more obvious in the poetry that hadn't been on my mental checklist. I said, the rhythms are crucial. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say as a literary person that uh, in the, the languages, uh, that I can read. I wish the, the, uh, there were more of them, but I read a few. Uh, in the language that I can lead, uh, read, I don't think there's any great literary prose that is not rhythmic in some way or another. Uh, so um, if you translate the, uh, it, it's the beating heart of the prose, I, I, I would say. Mm -hmm. So if you translate biblical Hebrew, the, the, the prose narrative in, in particular into a rhythmic language, which is true of all the modern versions. Well, with the exception of, of uh, Everett Fox's interesting experiment, uh, the, then uh, you, certainly all the modern versions by committee, um, mm -hmm. you, uh, it's dead just as a, a, a human body is dead when it goes into acute a arrhythmia. So I, I then was conscious of that as I proceeded.